choir for the wonderful singing. Appreciate the message and song today. Want to just encourage you today to uh, understand a couple things that God is doing and very excited as uh, uh, we look to a text today. We're continuing to build on the theme of seeing the need and I want to ask you a question and I think it's very, very important that we, we get a, a feel for this. Jesus in Matthew 9 saw those around him. He had compassion on them. He saw their situation. He was broken by it. He worked towards it. We appreciate that. They weren't just hungry. They were, he, they were directionless. So Jesus saw their spiritual need that they lacked direction. They lacked a pastor. They lacked a shepherd. And he addressed it. So I want to ask a question today. How far can you see? You know, a lot of us are very good at meeting the needs of our immediate family. And that's very appropriate. Matter of fact, our Sunday school class dealt with the text today. You know, if you, if you don't take care of your own, you're worse than an infidel. Most of us understand the idea of my child's hurting, I'm going to help my child. Most of us are pretty good with the idea of my parents are hurting, I'm going to help my parents. Most of us are pretty good with the idea of my siblings are hurting, I'm going to help my siblings. Most of us are pretty good with the idea of my best friend's hurting, my best friend has a need, I'm going to help my best friend. But how far are you able to see the need of those around you? That really is a fundamental question that we have to answer. Uh, the passage of scripture I shared with the children, I want you to turn with me to Genesis 13, and I want to be reminded of this wonderful story in the life of Abraham. Abraham and Lot, you know the story pretty well, I'm sure. Abraham gets called out to his own land that God has promised for him, and, and uh, God is doing all these wonderful things in his life, and Abraham and Lot are both prospering, and they have to split, and the Bible tells us that Lot uh, focused his attention in the direction where Sodom was, but Abraham went the other direction, and verse 14 of Genesis 13 says this, that the Lord said unto Abram, uh, that Lot had separated from him, lift up thine eyes and look from the place where thou art northward, and southward, and eastward, and westward. For all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed forever. Wow. Can you imagine Abraham? By the way, Abram becomes Abraham shortly, so forgive me if I call him Abraham. But can you imagine grabbing hold of that promise? Abram, how far can you see north? How, how, how far can you see to the south? How far can you see to the east and to the west? All that you can see. I'll give it to you. That's a credible promise, isn't it? Have you ever thought about that? There's a story told during the Great Depression that there was a church outside of Nashville, Tennessee, that they were going to build them a little building. And they dug this huge basement. And the people started complaining that they had a basement. Why did they need a basement? Why didn't we just build a little building? Why did we build a basement? And they showed up a couple Sundays later and the pastor had erected a sign that read, How far can you see? And he challenged them to think beyond their immediate need. Because see, they could have built a little building cheaper that would have just held their current number. But instead they had a vision to say that God was going to plant us to reach a community in a city in a outside of Nashville, Tennessee, during the Depression, much smaller than it is today. Inglewood Baptist Church in Nashville, by the way, is the church uh, with an I, Inglewood. You can Google it. It's a huge church today. Began with the vision of somebody to say, you know, we're going to see beyond our current needs. We're not just going to address our problem for today, but we're going to fix the problem for the future. I wonder how far can you see your Christian life? How far can you see in the life of our church? Because when I think about Abraham, I'm reminded that, that God's promise to Abraham wasn't just a mediocre promise. 
It wasn't a little promise. It wasn't a medium-sized promise. But can you imagine Abraham standing there and, and God says, by the way, look as far as you can see to the north. Well, let me get my bearings here. Look as far as you can see to the north. And look as far as you can see to the south. And look as far as you can see to the east. And look as far as you can see to the west. Abram's going, that's a pretty good piece. And God said, I'm going to give it to you. And to your seed forever. You see, one of the big problems in the average Christian's life is we tend to see things, uh, certainly the American Christian's problem, is we tend to see things in, in, in the immediate we don't tend to think long term. Now, uh, one of the great problems with that is that we want instant gratification and instant return, and we don't want any kind of long term investment thought process because we want answers and we want solutions and we want profit now. <sighs> microwave ovens. You know why we have microwave ovens? Because we want it hot and we want it hot now. Uh, those individual coffee pot things, those Keurigs, you know why they're so popular? One hot cup of coffee now. Patience is not just a lost art, and, uh, but long-term investment is not, a, is not a thing we think about. As a matter of fact, one of the big things in our society today is these day traders. You know what they're trying to do? Trying to make all kinds of money in one day. You got to think long term. I am reminded that God doesn't look at the, the immediate. Now, notice what he says I'm going to give it to you and to your seed for a few weeks. No. God said, I'm going to give it to you and your seed forever. You know, one of the great problems with uh, parenting is that we want immediate results. And you want to know when you're a success as a parent? When your grandchildren are serving the Lord. Brother Steve, that's a terrible definition of success as parents. You know why? Because we want instant answers, don't we? We don't want to have to wait a lifetime. We don't want to make the daily investments that are required. We want instant results. I think about church and I think about church growth and I'm reminded that one of the biggest problems we have is that, that we don't understand the proper kind of church growth there is. A lot of people are really excited about biological church growth and I, I love it. Have you been by our nursery lately? It's the coolest thing in the world. All those little guys in there, it's just wonderful. You know, we got the Heiser twins and we got uh, Caleb and Jace uh, fighting each other all the time in there and we got... Uh, the, the two-year-olds, we got the, the Bo and Lucy, and we, we got Luke, and we got Luke, and we got uh, uh, the other heartless kid, Alex, and Diesel, and we got uh, all kinds. And they're just in there having the time of their lives. Lucy's running the place, by the way. She really is the girl. She's in control. You know, there's nothing absolutely more important than looking at those little guys and going, wow, praise God for these little lives. Thank God for parents who chose to have children, and thank God for a church that can nurture children, and thank God for parents and workers who work together to work in nursery and nurture children. There's nothing more wonderful than that. But if our only hope for reaching our community is the children that are born into our church family, we're going to fail. Because more children are born in our community than are in our nursery. Then there's a lot of people who say, well, Brother Steve, you know, what we need to do is we need to figure out a way to reach people from other churches and and, and, and look at things that way. Wouldn't that be just great, Brother Steve? Maybe we should just pray that a couple churches around us will close and we'll get some of their members. Now, what a horrible prayer is that? Well, let's, let's just hope they have a big split down the road and we'll get a bunch of good people. Listen, if there's a big split down the road, we probably don't want those people. Thank you through. God's projects for us are, are so important and so driven that, that we need to understand the importance of what we're all about. I am thoroughly convinced that the number one problem with the average church member is that they honestly believe that somebody else will do all the soul winning. 
They honestly believe that, you know, God's program is big. He wants us to go into all the world, and that's great, and I'll pray that people will do that instead of involving themselves in things. Can I ask you a question? I, I think that there's nothing wrong with anything that, that glorifies the Lord, that helps reach people, and there's no question that we need to make certain that we have programs that are attractive, that are well done, that we strive for excellence. But I want to encourage you today to understand that sometimes our vision is just too small. We don't see our community. Let me ask you a simple question. How many people drive by our church building in a given day? Would fill our facility multiple times, wouldn't it? So just putting a sign out by the highway is not a way to reach people. It's one way to strive to inform and communicate but to reach people, it requires us to have a vision that people need to see Jesus. We don't see people as people that need Jesus anymore. We see people as them. Can I ask you, how far do you see? When you look at your neighbors, do you see them just as good neighbors or bad neighbors? Good yard keepers, bad yard keepers, uh, nice car drivers, not so nice car drivers. Oh, they got a boat, they must like the lake. You know, we evaluate all sorts of things all the time, but we've forgotten to see them spiritually. How far do you see? We, we're so peripheral. We, we, we're so just limited in what we see. Well, Pastor, as long as every bill's getting paid on time, the church is doing good. That is important. And yes, we're sort of current right now. But listen to me. Seeing beyond the end of the month is a requirement. Because until God calls the church to heaven, we have a responsibility to be the church. And to be the church here. And to be the church now. You ever think about God and how he works? His promise to Abraham, was it a little promise or a big promise? I'll give you everything you can see forever. That's a pretty big promise, isn't it? You know, matter of fact, people have been hating Abraham's, Abraham's descendants ever since, haven't they? And that land over there is the most fought over land in the world, in the history of the world. Because people are mad that God chose to give to somebody. Let me ask you this, was a worldwide flood, was that a big thing or a little thing? <laughs> you know, it's a big thing. The whole world was destroyed by flood. That's a pretty big deal. What about, uh, think about Moses leading uh, two and a half, three million, six million people out of bondage into the land of promise. Little thing or big thing? That's a pretty big deal, wasn't it? What about God sending uh, uh, the work that he did through the prophets? And, and what about God interrupting human history by sending his own son? Big deal or little deal? That's a big deal, isn't it? You see, God focuses us on how we see things. God sees the need. But now I want to share a passage of Scripture with you that drives me crazy, that scares me, that burdens me, that overwhelms me, that breaks my heart, that consumes me, that haunts me. I don't know the right words to use. It, Mark chapter 6. Turn with me, if you would, please, to Mark chapter 6. In Mark chapter 6, now, Jesus has just raised Jairus' daughter in the 5th chapter. And then he comes back towards Nazareth where he grew up. And we find verses 5 and 6. Referring to Jesus. And he could there do no mighty work. Except that he laid his hands upon a few sick folk and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. And he went round about the villages teaching. He could there do no mighty work. Does that bother you? What is it about the people of Nazareth that interfered with Jesus going about doing the work that he was doing, the mighty works that he was doing? 
Why is it that in his hometown there was no possibility for people to let it? Because the people there couldn't see beyond what they thought Jesus was. That's Joseph's boy. The Messiah. They wouldn't see beyond what they thought they understood in order to let God really do something powerful. Can I tell you something? God has a tremendous plan for the whole world. God has a plan for his church, and God has a plan for you as an individual Christian. And, and the question is, how far can you see? You know, we, we talk about believing the Bible. Do we practice it? We talk about uh, Matthew uh, chapter 16 where Jesus says the gates of hell should not prevail against him and against the work of his church. And yet we're easily discouraged when people slam a door in our face. Or we're easily discouraged when, oh, there's no soliciting, we shouldn't. We're easily discouraged when, when things don't seem to go our way. We feel defeated and ever, oh, pastor, you know, we've got to worry about these new laws, you know. No, we just have to address them honestly. But the reality is Jesus has promised that the gates of hell themselves will not prevail against this church. Jesus has a pretty big plan, Matthew 28. We call it the Great Commission. We're to go into all the world and preach the gospel to uh, everyone that will listen to us effectively the first time. That's not what he said. We're to take the gospel everywhere to everyone. Why? Because God wants us to have a vision far beyond ourselves and our little part of the world. Is that a big vision or a little vision? Did God tell the church, now listen, you're going to get defeated and stopped all the time, so just, just quit when you get discouraged. No, he empowered us, and he equipped us, and he's charged us with worldwide mission. Then in Acts chapter 1, he, he defines it very clearly. We start at home, and we just keep going. We do outreach in many ways. You know, I, I think it, it, there, is, there is in one sense that we have a responsibility to be salt and light where we are. And people need to see that we're salt and light. In Matthew 28, though, it says very clearly we're to go, we're to proclaim. I'll be real honest with you. We've, we've got to get beyond just this idea that, well, I'm going to let my light shine. Because if you're letting your light shine and you don't tell your neighbors why your light's turned on, they might not understand it's to glorify Jesus. Others need to see your good works, yes, and glorify your Father which is in heaven. But if the Rotary Club is doing the exact same thing the church is doing, we need to make certain that our message is clear. We're doing it because Jesus compels us, not because it's a good idea in society. I believe with all of my heart that we will never reach our community simply by striving to live good Christian lives, short of also going and telling them about Jesus. Matter of fact, you may have never heard this before, but there's a real distinct chance that you'll never share a gospel track with anybody if you don't have a gospel track on you to share with them. And that, that's radical, isn't it? You know, if somebody asks you what church you go to and you have a gospel track on you, you can turn to the back of the gospel track and you say, oh, here's my church. Oh, and by the way, read the little flyer here. Keith Ford, the evangelist, tells the story. The old boy got saved one night, and he was buying gas the next day, and he, he so desperately wanted to share the gospel, and he was so afraid, he was pumping gas. The guy walked over, he gave him his money. He looked at the gas station tent, and he said, Can you read? And the guy said, Yes. He said, Here, read this. Sharing the gospel. But you know, if our vision isn't that our neighbors need Jesus, we'll never share the gospel with them. We need to see beyond the peripheral. We need to see beyond, oh, they're nice people. We need to see beyond, oh, they have a nice yard. We need to see beyond, oh, well, I think they go to church. We need to share the gospel. You know, there's a significant difference from the biblical command of going to the highways and the hedges and compelling them to come and the sad commentary of today's modern church, read my blog. Do you see the difference? Jesus says, go into the highways and hedges and compel them to come. And the modern church says, read my blog. By the way, a blog is a, it's a, like a journal online. It's a web blog. It's, it's like keeping notes but posting them on the Internet. Yeah, really exciting, isn't it? You know, as a matter of fact, a lot of people blog about really stupid stuff. 
You know, you can post online where you're eating lunch and whether or not you enjoyed it or not. Isn't that exciting? And so many churches today think if we just have an internet presence, we don't have to do evangelism. Where, where is the difference between going and compelling and going to the highways and hedges, going to all the world, and this modern idea that let's just have a presence? We don't see people as needing the gospel anymore, apparently. We have too small a vision. We have too small a plan. What about your own Christian life? Let me be real honest with you this morning. The average Christian grows in Christ as much as they really want to. Did you hear me? Don't you dare blame anybody else for your spiritual immaturity. Because you'll grow in Christ exactly as much as you want to. Well, you know, if the church just offered more programs, well, if you don't come to the ones we're offering now, why do you think you'd come to more? Bible studies, our Wednesday nights, our Sunday nights, our special programs, Sunday school, you know how valuable it is just to spend time with other believers around the Word of God? You are in Christ. You are growing as much as you want to grow. Matter of fact, I'll be real honest with you. The average Christian, you know why the average Christian doesn't read the Bible? They don't want to. There's no excuse in today's society. You know, I get an email every morning with a Bible reading schedule. I get an email every morning with a Bible reading schedule I can follow. Do you know that in my phone right now, uh, I've got the Gideon app, and it's got multiple translations. It's got them in drama. Have I told you all this? This is so cool. You can listen to a drama of the Bible, and you can set a sleep timer. You can fall asleep listening to the, to the Bible if you want. Of course, it kind of keeps me awake, so I can't do that very well, but... You, ever, you can listen to the Bible in your car. You can listen to the Bible with your earbuds. You can read the Word of God. You know, the average Christian spends as much time engaged with the Word of God as they choose. In America, parts of the world, they don't have a full Bible to read. We've got dozens of them on our shelves and in our phones. How far can you see your own Christian life? Oh, Pastor, I, I just, I just, I'm going to be a good church member. Maybe someday I'll help with Bible school, and, and maybe someday I'll uh, help with a Sunday school. You know, I'll get on that. I, I'll cook a dinner some Wednesday night. Wonderful. That's all good stuff, isn't it? Are you growing? Let me ask you a question. How far do you see your own Christian life? Do you believe that God's called you to be saved? And if he has, do you believe he's called you to reach others? Because if you're saved, he's called you to reach others. You shall be witnesses. Truth tellers. How far do you see for our church? When was the last time you you thought about joining an outreach team? When was the last time you thought about being involved in something that would encourage others? Or is church just what you get out of it? Let me share a couple of verses. Write some of these down if you, if you want to encourage. Is, is, the, is the Lord's church an important thing? Well, Matthew 28, 18 reminds us that all power is given unto Jesus and that he has given us a challenge. I've already quoted Matthew 16, 18, that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. Philippians 4, 13 reminds us that in Christ I'm able to do the things he's called me to do. I can do all things through him. Uh, Philippians 4, 19 reminds us, but God is the one who supplies all my needs. Jesus has promised to be with us over in Matthew 28, 20. And then James 4, 2 says this, you have not because you ask not. You, you say, well, pastor, I'm just not growing Christ the way I want to. You've not asked Because you got short vision. How great is your God? Is your God able to supply your need like he's promised? Is your God able to equip you and send you on the task? Is your God able to provide for you? I shared the Mark 6 passage of Scripture with you. There's an Old Testament equivalent to it. and In the 78th Psalm, we read the 41st verse. It says this, Yea, they turned back and tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. 
Now, in the 78th Psalm, he's, he's reliving the Exodus experience. Now, can you imagine, just for a few moments with me, being involved in the Exodus? You were in bondage, you were a slave, and, and God miraculously, through the plagues and, and through the provisions of Moses, leads you out of the land of bondage, and you, 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 you've seen the miracles of God, you, you cross the Red Sea, you, you wake up every morning and there's manna on the ground, there's fresh water to drink, you, you, you've had everything provided for you, your clothes don't wear out, the leather of your shoes doesn't wear out, God has provided for you, and in the midst of all of that, you start to complain. You know, it's pretty sad we have to eat the same food every day. Sure beats starving, doesn't it? You know, it's pretty sad that I can't get any new shoes, you know. Well, the old ones aren't wearing out. That's odd to complain about, isn't it? The hand of God provides safety and security and provision, and at, and at every front, all they do is gripe about it because they forgot how great their God was. I think the fact that we limit what God is going to be able to do, I tell you something, a lot of people, listen to me, a lot of people are more interested in getting their way out of church or getting God to agree with them or, you know, as long as, you know, oh, you want to know the number one problem in most churches today? Parents and grandparents. Boy, little Johnny. You better treat him just exactly the way Grandma wants him treated. You know, he should have got the starring role in the Christmas pageant last year. Grandparents are even worse. You know, rules don't apply to their kids. You know why? Because they don't see the church as a place where they serve. They see a church that must serve them and their needs. And sadly, they're teaching that to the next generation. Church has never been what you can get out of it. Church has always been what you can put into it. Jesus didn't die on the cross, and Jesus didn't start a church just to make you feel good about yourself on Sundays most of the time when you grace the church with your presence. The church is a living organism that God has commissioned to go into all the world, equipped with all power, and given us a charge to see people. And once we see their need, addressing it. I get really burdened. The number of people who church to them is simply what I can get out of it. How far can you see? Can you see beyond your petty problems this morning? Can you see a church that is commissioned to reach a community? Can you see the urgency of the hour that the world is pagan, the world is lost? The world is without hope and that we have a responsibility bearing the name of Christ to go to all the world. Or do you just see your little circle? Man, I'm happy in my little circle. I love my wife, my kids. Oh, I got the best grandkids on the planet. You know, I've worked hard. All my bills are paid on time, and I've got food on the table and little money put away, and, man, everything's great. Is that what God's called us to be? How far can you see? Abram, how far can you see to the north? How far can you see to the north, Abram? Why well, see all the way to that mountain range over there? What about to the south? Oh, man, I, I can see all the way down. Yeah, man, as far as I can see. What about, what about to your east, Abram? All the way over to that lake, that body of water? What about to, you mean... All the way over there to that one, too? The church of the Lord Jesus was never meant to be a little bubble in the community.
We are called. The same one who called you to salvation calls you to go and tell others. How do you see Jesus this morning? See, a lot of people see Jesus as just their problem solver. Well, whenever things don't go the way I think they should go, I say, now, Jesus, give me a little hand. Or do you see Jesus as the one who's resourcing you and providing for you and guiding you? How great is your God? Do we believe it's our call to rescue the perishing? Or is it just something we sing? How far can you see this morning? Now, I want to be real honest. I, I'm not mad at anybody. I'm burdened. Some of you are only happy if you get your way all the time. Some of you are only happy if, you know, if, if, if it's all about you. Where, where do we reconcile that mentality with giving our lives to Christ? It's about him. I talked to a young man one time. He was coming home from the mission field. Things didn't go the way he thought it should go in the mission field, so he quit. And I'll never forget this conversation, and I, I'm not the best at remembering verbatim conversations, but I'll never forget this man's words. It just didn't work well for us. So we decided to come home and hope God will bless it. Why did you go? I felt a calling. Why did you come home? It was too rough. Did God call you to come home? Or was it just convenient? I wonder this morning, how great is your God? Will you say yes if he says do? Will you say yes if he says go? Will you say yes if he says be a blessing to someone else? Or is our vision so limited to just what we feel we need? We'll never see the world the way Jesus sees the world until we embrace his heart. How big is your God this morning? You know, we've set a goal of trying to put a gospel track on every home in Sellersburg between Easter and Thanksgiving. Big goal. Very achievable. But it's going to take a lot more people getting involved. What would happen if everybody you talk to about sports, you talk to them about Jesus? What would happen if everybody you talk to about the weather, you talk to about Jesus? What would happen? if you started seeing people as needing Jesus. How far can you see this morning? 
Mark 6, he could do there no mighty work, save that he laid hands on a few sick folk and healed them. And the Bible says that Jesus marveled because of their unbelief. What would he say about us? Do we believe God will? Do we believe that God can? Do we want God to do something? I'm going to ask you to bow your heads with me, if you would, please. And I'm going to invite our music team to come, and in just a moment, have a time of commitment. Now, I believe this morning that there are several people here today who have never accepted Christ as their personal Savior. You've never embraced the truth that Jesus loved you so much that he went to the cross for you. That because of your sin, he died. And that you can find eternal life by trusting in him through the repentance of sin. And this morning, if you're not 100% convinced, if you're not certain that you have new life in Christ, in just a moment when we start this invitation, you just come to the front, we'll share with you, we'll find your counselor, we'll do whatever it takes for you to be confident that you know the Lord Jesus this morning. But church family, this morning, I have to ask the question, what are you seeing? How are you seeing? Are you, are you looking far enough? Do you believe God can Or are you just playing? Pastor, you sounded mean this morning. I'm not sounding mean at all. I'm just trying to be honest. I fear God far more than I fear any of you. <laughs> God's called us to reach this community. He's called us to make a difference in this community. He's called us to go and touch this community and around the world. And sometimes we're so self-absorbed, we limit the Holy One of God. Do you believe God wants to use you to reach somebody with the gospel? Do you believe God wants to use our church to change our community? How far can you see this morning? This morning, maybe you need to be a part of our church family. Maybe you've never joined our church, and you need to do that today. Maybe you're a believer, but you've never been baptized, and you need to come, and we'll schedule baptism as quickly as we can, because that's important. Or maybe this morning, you have other spiritual needs. You need to talk to counsel. We'd love to share with you, encourage you any way we can this morning. Whatever we can do to make certain that you know when you leave this place that you're leaving in obedience to the leadership of the Holy Spirit of God, we want that for you. Maybe there's sin in your life that you need to deal with. Maybe you're just so self-absorbed that you can't get beyond the, the sin in your life. And until that's dealt with, you'll never be able to see what God wants you to see. Now, Father, it's in the name of Jesus I ask your blessings on this time of commitment. Father, please encourage us, strengthen us, and help us to be obedient as we strive to live for you.